uh, contact and and person to person interaction, but this is, I guess, the next best thing in the times that we're living through right now. Um, so I'm going to talk about imaging of prostate cancer, and then uh, after me, Dr. Kelly will talk about the treatment options um, that are coming into clinical reality. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about um, how we image prostate cancer. And then um, we'll briefly discuss how imaging helps, that is in the staging of prostate cancer, um, selecting patients for radioligand therapy, which Dr. Kale will be talking about, and then checking the effectiveness of whatever treatment is being um, chosen for the treatment of the prostate cancer. So how do we image prostate cancer? Uh, there are different types of scanning or imaging um, we have what we call anatomical imaging, and that shows structures. The most important um, uh, modalities for this are CAT scanning or CT, MRI, which works with uh, magnetic fields, and then ultrasound, which works with sound waves. We in nuclear medicine use what is called molecular imaging, which really gives us molecular information about the cancer. And the modalities that do this are SPECT, which stands for Single Photon Emission Computer Tomography, and PET, which stands for Positron Emission Tomography. And then um, to combine anatomical imaging and molecular imaging, we have what we call fused imaging, where we combine SPECT with CT or PET with CT. With these combined modalities, we can look at structure and molecular information at the same time. So back to anatomic imaging, um, these anatomical imaging modalities use x-rays, magnetic fields, or ultrasound, and as I said, they image structure. In the case of x-rays or CAT scans, you have a machine that produces x-rays, they're sent through the body, and then the x-rays get changed by traveling through the body, and that information can be used to create an image. So this is what a CAT scan looks like. This is the, the body looking at the body from the front. You can see some of the spine here. This is the pelvis down here, liver, kidneys, and so on. Now, when we do molecular imaging, we use radioactive tracers. And depending on what the tracers um, are made of, they allow us to see what is happening inside the body um, at the molecular and cellular level. Tracers that are specific for prostate cancer target structures that are present on the prostate cancer cells. So this is a prostate cancer cell here. You have a structure that's present on the prostate cancer cell, and we have a tracer that attaches to this structure. It has a radioactive isotope attached to it. This radioactive isotope emits photons, and this, these can be picked up by the nuclear medicine cameras and used to create an image. Now, um, we have different tracers that are available for prostate cancer imaging, and they all target different structures on the prostate cancer cells. All right. So the one that's currently having a lot of press is PSMA. And the structure on the prostate cancer cell is called prostate-specific membranous antigen. That's what PSMA stands for. And it image the tracer images the expression of this target that's present on most prostate, can prostate cancer cells. And then you get the molecular information. Some of it is what we call physiologic uptake, such as here in the liver and the kidneys. Then you have this uptake here, which is probably in the bone, which is abnormal. Currently, there is an approved tracer that is called um, Axumen, which stands for 18F uh, Fusiclovin. This is currently the approved trace of prostate cancer imaging, and it targets amino acid transporters that are, that are expressed on prostate cancer cells. And then some of the older traces that have been around for many years, such as C11 acetate or F18F choline, these target fatty acid metabolism and cell membrane synthesis, which is upregulated in prostate cancer cells. So the only one of these traces that is really FDA approved is currently is uh, fusiclovin or so known as axumin. Now, um, 
PSMA is not yet FDA approved, but there've been lots of studies <clears throat> comparing um, exumin with the PSMA tracer. And this is a study from Dr. Calais that was recently published in, in Lancet Oncology. And you can see here in pink, this is uh, the detection rate of PSMA for prostate cancer overall compared to fluciclovin or, or exumin here. And you can see detection rate is more than twice as good um, overall than uh, compared to exumin. And then this breaks it down into the different regions in the body and the prostate bed. Um, there was a slight advantage of fluciclovin, not significant. The both traces work reasonably, reasonably good in the detection of prostate cancer recurrence in the prostate bed in patients that have undergone prostatectomy. Now, when it comes to the detection of disease outside the prostate bed, that is pelvic lymph nodes, extra pelvic lymph nodes, disease that has spread to the bone or other organs, um, PSMA uh, performs significantly better than the fluciclovin. So PSMA is the better tracer um, based on many studies, this being one of them compared to exumin. So fused imaging that I alluded to combines structural and functional information. And the modalities that use uh, both uh, structural and functional information are SPECT-CT, PET-CT and uh, PET-MRI. So here you can see a, an image of a patient that I showed you earlier, where I showed you the um, molecular information. And now we have fused this with the CT information. And now I can clearly see where this uptake, abnormal uptake of tracer is taking place. I can clearly localize it to a vertebra in the lumbar spine. So now I have all the information that I need um, to appropriately treat this patient. I know what's going on and I know where it's going on. So how can we use the information that we get for imaging? Well, the most common indications for um, imaging are staging when the patient is diagnosed and restaging when a patient has undergone treatment and there's concern for the disease having come back. And depending on what the stage is, um, has very important uh, implications in what the optimal treatment for the patient is. And roughly, uh, Prostate cancer staging uh, stages can be broken down into localized disease, where the disease is localized to the prostate bed or the prostate gland in, in primary staging, as in this patient here. There is something that is called oligometastatic. Uh, oligo is a Greek word and it means few. And it's usually considered for patients that have five or fewer uh, metastatic lesions in the body. And then there is metastatic disease, as in this patient here, where you can see widely spread um, abnormalities throughout the, throughout the body. So all of these uh, different stages, I usually offer different treatment options. In metastatic disease, you have to use systemic treatment, treatment that is, works throughout the body. In oligometastatic disease, you can target the individual lesions either with surgery or more commonly with radiation treatment that is focused on these lesions. And in localized disease, if it's localized to the prostate, the treatment of choice usually is um, either surgery or radiation treatment to the prostate. And um, just to look at how well uh, gallium PSMA performs in the management of prostate cancer, this was a study that we did at UCLA where we looked at 161 patients um, with a PSMA PET-CT scan and referring physicians had to complete a questionnaire before the scan and after the scan. And the questionnaire had questions about how the patients would be managed based on the information that was available before the scan and information that was available after the scan. And we found that in more than two thirds of patients um, the management plans were changed based on the information that the PET CT, PSMA PET CT provided. So that just highlights the importance of the information that you receive from the scan. Appropriate staging will dictate subsequent treatment. And the better the staging, the better you can tailor the treatment. 
Now, imaging can also help us select patients for radioligand therapy. Again, Dr. Kelly will talk about this in a, in a couple of minutes. So just to recall, when we do imaging, we have a tracer that targets a structure that's present on the prostate cancer cells. The tracer binds to that structure and it has a radioactive isotope attached to it that allows us to take a picture. When we do radioligand therapy, we target that same structure that's present on the prostate cancer cell, but we use a different radioactive isotope that emits electrons um, and locally destroys um, the tumor cells. So when we take a picture with a scan, we want to have information of how much of that structure that we can use for treatment is expressed on the prostate cancer cells. So if we have a lot of PSMA expressed on the prostate cancer cells, we'll see a lot of uptake. But these patients would be good candidates for the radioligand uh, treatment. Sometimes cancers express fewer of these targets on the, on the cell surface, and then you'll see less uptake. Depending on what the clinical scenario is, we have to say these patients are not candidates, sometimes they are candidates. And then some cancers express almost none of these receptors. You'll see no uptake on the scan. Obviously these patients are not candidates for the treatment. Now, anytime we do any kind of treatment, we wanna see whether the treatment is effective. So when we treat, um, we can have different outcomes. We treat the cancer, this is the cancer. Our, our most desirable outcome, of course, is that the cancer completely disappears. And also a desirable outcome is for the pan cancer to get smaller. In some cases, all that we achieve is to keep the cancer from growing any further. And these three outcomes we can summarize under stabilization of disease. Unfortunately, um, the, um, what can also be the case is that the cancer progresses, it gets bigger and it develops additional metastasis. Now we have to find out what's going on and the only way we can find out what's going on after treatment or during treatment is to image patients and to see whether the treatment is working. Um, in which case, if you imagine this is the cancer cell and the size of the cancer cell or the cancer, I should say, not a single cell and the color um, is the expression of the target that we use to assess the molecular changes. So normally if the treatment is working, the cancer will get smaller and will have a decrease in uptake. Sometimes we will see a decrease in the size of the cancer, but it retains its molecular properties and will still have expressed a lot of the target and we'll see the same degree of tracer uptake that we saw on the um, baseline scan. If we dis all we achieve is disease stabilization, the cancer will not get smaller, but will prevent it from getting larger and it usually expresses the same degree of, of, of tracer uptake, meaning that the expression of the target is stable. Sometimes the treatment is not working, the cancer will get bigger. It may still retain the expression um, of the um, target structure, but sometimes what can happen when it gets bigger it can also lose this um, structure that it was expressing that we were able to pick up on the baseline imaging. These are usually cancers that de-differentiate. De-differentiation usually means they become more aggressive and more aggressive and de-differentiated usually means a loss of the target structure that was initially present. Here's an example of a patient. This is from uh, Dr. Baum from Germany, um, a patient that um, had a lot of disease throughout the body. This patient was treated with radioligand therapy and this patient was able to achieve um, the ideal outcome where you had a disappearance um, of all the lesions. So the scan here can help us assess the treatment outcome, which was um, the ideal outcome. So in summary, um, talking about PSMA, the tracer binds to the PSMA, the prostate specific membranous antigen that's present on prostate cancer cells. I should say on most more than 95% of prostate cancers. 
Why do we do imaging? We do imaging to stage the disease initially when patients are diagnosed. And the staging is usually done in um, higher risk prostate cancer. If it's low risk prostate cancer, then patients usually don't, uh, the need for staging is less. And then restaging is performed um, in patients that had initial treatment and they have evidence of the recurrence of the disease, their PSA goes up and we find, wanna find out what's going on. And then imaging is also used to find suitable candidates for RLT. Although this is, as I said before, not yet FDA approved. So imaging is done at diagnosis, at initial staging, and then restaging after treatment. Now, last year, um, we didn't have um, much to tell you about when this tracer that is better than the currently approved Exumen would receive FDA approval. In the meantime, um, thanks to Dr. Kalei's outstanding work um, and multiple uh, imaging protocols and studies that we have going at UCLA, we've imaged about 3,000 patients. We know that this tracer works, it works very well. Um, we have submitted to the FDA for approval of this tracer. Unfortunately, the COVID crisis has delayed everything, um, but we are led to expect that there will be approval in the near future although near future or soon is a very relative term. Um, we are hoping by the end of the year, but we don't know, to be honest. We have imaging available at the interim, although most of our research studies have closed in by now because we have completed enrollment. We do have a, an expanded access protocol that continues to allow us to image patients at cost price. So imaging continues to be available um, at UCLA. Okay, that's it for my part. Um, I will now try to release my share and um, let Dr. Calais speak. Great, let me try my turn. I'm gonna share this and you probably seen Yosemite and now you've seen the slides. All right, can you hear me? Well, that's good. All good, okay. Yes, we can hear you. Very good. And this, you can see the pointer probably as well. So thanks for inviting uh, me and us again. It's a pleasure to share our experience with PSMA diagnostics for prostate cancer to the community. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to, to give these presentations to another audience than, um, than usually other doctors. It's good to talk to patients. So it would be difficult to not overlap too much with what just Martin said. It was a very nice presentation and um, there will maybe be some redundancy, but I think repeating is can be always good. So first, I want to redefine what is teranostic. Teranostic is the uh, the term that we use for combining a therapeutic agent or concept with a diagnostic agent or molecule, and this turns out to be teranostic. The overall concept is individualized medicine among a population of patients. You would do a targeted imaging that would select patients that have the target for a specific therapy. And if patients are positive for a target, then they are more likely to respond positively to the treatment and they can get this targeted therapy. So you see the target, you treat the target. That is what is theranostic. And that's perfect for nuclear medicine because what is nuclear medicine? Nuclear medicine, as Martin just explained very well, is the medical use of radioactive drug. You inject into the patient, you know the target that is uh, seeking for, and if you attach a radionuclide to it, then with the radiation that are emitted, you can use this radiation on the target to do either targeted imaging with PET-CT or targeted radiotherapy or molecular radiotherapy, which is the same than radio ligand therapy or radionuclear therapy. So as Martin just 
nicely said and pointed out, PSMA PET is now the most current sensitive prostate cancer imaging modality that we have. It is it has been shown to be superior to conventional imaging, which is CT and bone scan, superior to choline PET, and now superior to fluciclovin PET, or also known as axumin. So with a more sensitive imaging tool, we see the disease earlier and better. So we can do better targeted therapy, and such as focal radiation therapy in patients with oligometastatic disease. So what is oligometastatic disease? Oligometastatic disease, it, a, it is a term or a concept that has been probably introduced in 1995 in this editorial. And these authors suggested that the number and site of metastasis may reflect the state of tumor development and possibly different tumor stage and even almost different disease. It's not the same to have 20 mets than only one or maybe three or five. And by defining uh, the oligometastatic disease, it can lead to uh, therapy that are uh, targeting these uh, few sites. And we can hope that this is the only visible part of the disease. So there is a theory that is called seed and soil that metastases, when they occur, they can re-metastase again, not necessarily from the primary site. And it is, there is also another theory that oligometastatic disease may be the slow growing indolent disease uh, of comparing to another patient with more metastases. So now the main, the main challenge for uh, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist and the imaging doctors is to make the difference between a true oligometastatic patient that has really one, two or three metastases and nothing else and a patient that has the same kind of pattern on imaging scan, but in fact, there is much more we just cannot see because it's micrometastasis. Also the, the number, the threshold, you probably have heard already that you have more than five or more than three metastases, and this threshold is still uh, not clearly accepted one or the other. And now we will also need to redefine patients' uh, oligometastatic state based on these new imaging scans. Before it was done with CT bone scan and we got more sensitive with choline. So maybe a patient was non-metastatic on CT bone scan. Then he became maybe oligo or single metastatic on axumin and choline PET. And with PSMA PET, maybe he has more and he's not eligible to oligometastatic ther focused therapy anymore. But we have good stories in our practice at UCLA. I'm gonna show a few examples here. Um, this is a patient who had surgery in 2007. Then he got a recurrence, uh, it's 11 years later, so already a pretty good result of the surgery. PSA came back at 0.2. He did the first PSMA PET that was negative. So it is known that at a PSA level of 0.2 like this, the sensitivity of the scan is still low, even though if PSMA PET is one of the best and most sensitive imaging tool we have still at PSA of 0.2, the disease is very small and difficult to see. So he received standard radiation therapy to the prostate bed and without any ADT, which is the common treatment to, to do in patients who had recurrence after surgery because we assume that the recurrence is some prostate cancer cells left down there in the prostate bed. And then you can see here, two years later, the PSA still increased 2.6. So he redid a PSMA PET. And on this PSMA PET, you can see this single focus here, only one lesion, pretty tiny. For sure on the CD, it would have been missed. You can see it here, a little bit of the white that you can see, that's what we call the sclerosis, but it was very difficult to catch. What enabled to see it is the signal of the PSMA PET. And he was treated with radiation therapy just on this lesion, nothing else, no hormonal therapy. And you can see that the PSA went from 0.6 to 0.03 three months after. And now we are more than two years later, last PSA was in August, and you can see still undetectable PSA. So pretty good story. We have another one or many other ones like that, in fact. 
here is a little bit more, more or less the same story. Patient had surgery in 2010. The PSA never went to zero just after. So one year after, because the PSA was not at zero, he received again salvage radiation therapy to the prostate bed, the area where was the prostate before, and the pelvic lymph nodes, where we suppose some potential micrometastatic disease is. But you can see it didn't work because six years yet later, I mean, it still worked because it gave him six year kind of free of disease, but the PSA increased and increased up to 1.6, as you can see here. And at that time, he did a PSMA PET scan. The PSMA PET scan show again, a focus, very focal uptake here in a very tiny lymph node, which is called a perirectal lymph node. This is the rectum you can see here on the sagittal slice. And this very tiny lymph node, you can never call it on the CT only because it's too small, you're not sure what it is. You can call it only when you have that, this black spot, which is basically the PSMA PET tracer that is highly concentrated there because you have a lot of cancer cells there. And so it was detected like that. Patient got focal radiation therapy just on this lesion again, without hormonal therapy. And you can see decrease from 1.6 to 0.05. And three years later, now PSA is again undetectable. But we do have other types of stories. For example, this patient got focal radiation therapy to this pelvic lymph node, and you can see two years later, you have other lymph nodes coming out. Or this patient who got focal radiation therapy just to this lymph node, but then another one popped out two years later, and then one year later, another one coming out here. And it seems that when you look at the studies that look at patients who are treated with oligometastatic PSMA PET guided radiation therapy and who were restaged with a new PSMA PET to compare the PSMA PET before and after, PSMA PET revealed new metastasis in most of the case. So when it comes back, it's not in the fields of the radiation therapy, it's not a local recurrence, it is somewhere else. It's just that the disease was probably too small to be seen at that time there was probably a little focus here that we could not detect. So for us, it's difficult to make the, the difference between a patient who is like that, that had recurrence later on, and a patient who more or less was the same on imaging and had, for now, no recurrence at all. So probably maybe the whole disease was just in this lymph node. That's possible. But that still gives a lot of uh, let's say, solutions and hope to patients with limited burden of disease. These lesions before you couldn't see it on a CT or another scan. So now you have access to this kind of therapy. Of course, it's not perfect. It doesn't work in all, in all the cases, but at least it enabled the possibility of visualizing this small disease and treating it early. So Martin just uh, summarized it very nicely where can you get a PSMA PET scan in the US? It is still not FDA approved. It's still research only in the US. And so you have to get it within a clinical trial. For gallium 68 PSMA 11 PET, this is what we do at UCLA. The main sites on the West Coast are clearly UCLA and UCSF. You have other sites. You can probably find it on clinicaltrials.gov. And I want to say that you have other PSMA PET tracer. They are all PSMA PET basically showing where the PSMA protein is expressed and leading to same types of images and they all perform very well. So you have this one that we used at UCLA. There is another one that is free of use and that you can find uh, in Europe, but it's, uh, no one is using it in the US. And you have all these ones that are owned by industry companies and they're running clinical trials with that. Uh, this one is closed, this one is still recruiting, and this one will open. So these ones are owned by industry. It's basically the same molecule, but you have to get it within their clinical trials. And again, they are all PSMA PET, and they all perform very well. 
So at the end, if you have the opportunity to get one of these, it's good. It's PSMA PET. So now I'm going to switch to the radionuclear therapy or the molecular radiotherapy concept. So this is kind of a schematic representation of what can be PSMA prostate specific membrane antigen, a protein at the surface of the prostate cancer cells. And with this, again, you have these molecules in which you can attach a radionuclide such as gallium, that's the one you use to do PET imaging, or lutetium, that's the one you do for treatment because the radiations that are emitted don't travel a lot. They don't go out of the body. They just uh, deliver radiation just around where they have been emitted. And so maybe they can kill some cells where they have been emitted. I think I'm gonna show again this uh, video if it works, let me see. Hmm. See old slide. Doesn't work. Okay. So there were a few people who had the chance to, to see it last time, one year ago, two years ago. Uh, I have a technical issue. I apologize for that. Hmm. Let me see. All right, so where can you get this PSMA lutetium treatment? So far, it is still not approved in the US. Um, same thing, it's still a research procedures. It has mostly been used in Germany and in Australia initially, maybe in 2015, 16. Now it is also used in many other countries, India, Turkey, South Africa, many countries in Europe. So it, it starts to be very widely available. Uh, in the world. In the US, it was available through the clinical trial called Vision. I go, I will go over it in a few slides. And so initially that was maybe, yeah, in 2015, the first patients treated with this treatment, they had in Germany very nice stories to, to tell and to show such as this one, you can see very high burden of disease initially. And then after one, two, three, four injection, kind of clearance of the tumor burden as seen on the PSMA PET and the PSA decrease. So pretty impressive results at the beginning. And they mostly reported only the positive case that they wanted to show, of course, but still very promising. Many other publications follow. That's the Australian trial from Dr. Hoffman that had a high visibility and lead, uh, paved the way for many other trials and and development in this area. You can now, uh, since quite some time now, for quite some time, travel on some site like Booking Health to book your treatments and select a hospital that offers this treatment. So it became very popular. And in the US, so the, the drug, which is called Lutetium PSMA 617 is owned by Endocyte that is now owned by Novartis. And they run this big uh, randomized phase three trial, the typical uh, big trials run by big pharma companies. Uh, they hired or recruited 750 patients. The trial is now close to uh, enrollment and they are gathering data to analyze um, their there the, to compare the two the two arms and the outcomes and i think they will submit their nda application which is the fda approval for the us use of this drug um, they say maybe 2021 or something like that so we can hope that maybe they succeed and fda will let them uh, with approve their drug so at that time you can see it raised uh, Novartis was very interested in this uh, very promising treatment and, and acquired endocyte as a reflection of the very promising treatment. These were the sites in the US that were open at some point, and they are now closed. But we started before, and I'm going to show you a few uh, a local study that we did. It was investigator initiated and not uh, industry sponsored. It was really a pure academic study. And we studied before uh, endocyte took over the, the right for the molecule. 
And I'm going to show you here some results about the small cohort we treated at UCLA. Here is the setup we, we used. So I would say it was, we're still, um, Theranostic is still a new, almost a new specialty. So nuclear medicine division, they have to adapt uh, to this new workflow. So we use the prior scintigraphy room that is shielded. And so we, all this is for radio, radio protection purposes because when you're using lutetium, which is a radionuclide, it can have some, some, some spill and you know, all the radiation protection people, they have to be very careful about that. So that's why you have these pads on the floor. But basically at the end, you just sit in a chair, like in any chemotherapy infusion, and you just get your, your infusion done. And after a few times, you can, you can get out. So it's really done on an outpatient setting. And we hope to have a better setting than this one, uh, even though this one was already efficient. And here are the results. So you're probably uh, already familiar with this type of graph. I'm gonna go over a little bit the details and how you can read that. This is the baseline PSA level. Every bar that you see here is a PSA that's going up in one patient. And every bar that is going down is a PSA that is going down in one patient. So these are the PSA responders, the patient who had a PSA decreased. And here are the PSA non-responders, the patient who progressed till after receiving the therapy. And you can see, usually you say that you have a good response when compared to baseline, your PSA decreased by more than 50%. That's usually a way uh, researchers uh, find to decide if the PSA response is good or not. And in our 43 patients that we treated, you can see that 37% of them, so this would be these patients in comparison to the rest of the cohort. So 37% of them, which is 16 patients, had a PSA decline of more than 50% at any time. If you look at what is the response just after two cycles, uh, it was a little bit earlier, so you had less response with 28% of good PSA responders only. But in fact, when you look at the literature that followed all this promising article at the beginning, so this was published in 2018, summarizing many studies, as you can see here, the PSA decline of more than 50% actually occurred also in 34% in most of the published studies. So we're in line with what is reported out there in the world. And same here in this uh, study where they had 100 patients, the PSA decline of more than 50% was reported in 38% of the patients. So again, same type of rates, PSA response rates. I have to say, I didn't talk about that, but this is for metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. So pretty advanced patients. So having already this 30 to 40% of response rates is already a pretty good, pretty good score and a good, and a good thing for patients with such advanced disease. Here are some other types of curve. I don't know, I don't know if you're familiar with that. This is called kaplan meier curves. Uh, this is the time here that you have on the x-axis, and this is uh, when the events occur. I'm going. I don't, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but basically you can see that um, patients who were already very, very advanced, the overall survival after the treatment was about 15 months. So these are statistics. It's difficult to to take that for individual patients, but just for researcher is a way to, to uh, exploit the data. So I'm gonna pass that because I think it's too technical. What is interesting maybe for you is maybe what are the side effects because that's exactly what you can uh, experience if you receive this treatment that will probably, again, like I said, arrive on the US market maybe next year or something like that. Well, one of the most common side effects is the dry mouth. You can see now 43 patients, 63% of the patients had some dry mouth. Why? Because 
gonna show here. You can see this black uptake here. These are the salivary glands. And for some reason, the PSMA tracer, either the drug or the pet tracer, it goes there a lot and deliver a lot of radiation there. So radiation salivary gland gets some toxicity and that's why patient gets some dry mouth. Although you can see never severe and always reversible, but you have to know it. Then vomiting and nausea, this is still a drug that you get by IV uh, that has an effect on the whole body. So at the end, if you pull all these, you have two thirds of the patient who experience some vomiting or nausea uh, symptoms. Again, it was never too severe. You can see 5% of severe, but you also have to know it. And bowel disorders, bowel movement disorders, in half of the patients, never severe, but still you have to know it. And for the bone marrow function, you can see that um, drop in blood counts is frequent. You can see 65% of anemia, 47% of thrombocytopenia, 23% of um, neutropenia and 42% of lymphopenia. But it is usually reversible and very rarely severe, as you can see, except for the 23% of lymphocytopenia, uh, severe anemia in, or severe thrombocytopenia or severe neutropenia in only one or two patients. And interestingly, the kidney function or the kidney tolerance was excellent. You can see almost no, uh, no increase of the creatinine here, whereas Many people were concerned about that because when you see the image here, you can see the kidney, a lot of treatment goes there because you have PSM expression in the kidney. But at the end, it was, it was good. So, but if you compare the toxicity profile to chemotherapy, then it's much more well correlated at the end and it's much less toxic. These numbers are very good. It's, you don't have severe uh, bone marrow dysfunction you have very few severe side effects at the end. I'm gonna show you some images, good stories and bad stories. This patient, you can see the dots. So there are too many here to be targeted with focal radiation therapy by external beam radiation therapy. So PSMA radionuclide is a good option. You inject a drug and it will go basically everywhere you see black dots and deliver radiation therapy there. And cancer is sensitive to radiation therapy. And you can see disappearance of the black dots you were seeking for. That's a good, a good example. PSA dropped and the lesion disappeared. And now you have other types of patient. Maybe you come too late. Maybe the disease has a too aggressive behavior already. And then you give the treatment and after three cycles, still it doesn't work and the patient is progressing. That's another example of a good response. Here, we just segmented in red uh, the, the bone metastasis lesion, and you can see that decreased a lot on the follow-up scan after three cycles of treatment. And you can see also a decrease in PSA from 26 to 16, and a decrease of the volume of this lesion. And again, here it's the inverse, a patient who progressed after three cycles, there are more lesions than on the baseline scan. And it is new, so we're still learning and we still have a lot of things to learn, but uh, little by little, we're gathering data and, and improving how to use this treatment. Here I show different types of PSA response. You have patients that uh, progress right away after one or two cycles. So here clearly the drug is not effective. You have patients you can see that you have some effect. It kind of flattened the PSA progression curve, but it never put it down. You have some patient that has initially a decrease and a response, but ultimately they, they progress. And you have some patient that either progress initially, but respond very well or responded very well right away and a very low PSA here. So you have different types of patient. Now the aim for us doctors is to identify before 
these patients the one who are more likely to benefit from it. So this will be uh, our task. And I'm sure in the future, uh, we will be better at better selecting patients for uh, more individualized therapy. I show this, maybe this slide just here because the images are very impressive and it gives some uh, even more hope in what can coming in what can what treatment is coming in the in the future maybe four to five years from now I don't know I, I, I'm not sure but here instead of using lutetium you use actinium so it is a diff it has different physical properties basically the radiation dose that you deliver with this radionuclide is much higher so you can see patient with very high burden of disease that didn't very respond well to lutetium PSMA at the beginning and finally responded well because uh, they were using a higher radiation dose emitter than lutetium. Here, the main uh, problem is the salivary gland toxicity. You can see the salivary gland here. You don't see it anymore because it was burned. So they don't have saliva anymore, which is a, also a major problem that doctor has to fix before uh, implementing this new treatment. I put these uh, pictures here. That's the current setup at UCLA. And we are working with uh, Martin and also our, our chief, Johannes Chernin, to get a new center dedicated to Terranostics at UCLA. This may open maybe in two years from now. It is already in the plans with the architects. Just to show that this, uh, is, it is an, um, an evolving field. This was my last slide, so I want to take the whole team, the whole department, especially Martin. I'm gonna to switch to this slide. Martin is a very nice doctor and eminent professor, but he's also a very nice skier and the best uh, ski teammate you can have to go uh, in Sequoia Park. So I thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Jeremy. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, any questions? Larry Barman, do you have questions? Unmute yourself, Larry, you're muted. Larry, you're muted. Anybody else have questions? Yes, I, I have some questions. Okay. <laughs> Looks like Mr. Wasserman has a few questions. Is that you? Yes. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, when it comes to the trials that have been performed, what, what age groups are we talking about that you are showing the patients? <laughs> You're talking about the imaging trial or the treatment trial? Both. Both. Older than 18. Is there, a, is there an upper age limit? Like for someone like myself, 86. There no. is not. There is a lower age limit, as just uh, Martin pointed out, which is 18 years old. You must be more than 18 to be enrolled in a clinical trial. But other than that, there is no other limit and no upper age limit. So we had some patients of 100 years old, I think. Oh, okay. Doctor, is, uh, can I jump in now? Larry, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I've been with, the, my name is Larry Barman. I've been with the farm for about 15 years. And I want to tell you guys, uh, Dr. Jeremy and Dr. Martin, this is one of the pres best presentations I've heard of, okay, or I've participated in, I should say. Uh, okay. Since I've been with the forum, I sincerely mean that. Okay, and we would honor, be honored to have you back at some time in the future. Okay, uh, let me ask a few a uh, few questions here. One is, uh, we have a doctor, Nat uh, Lenzo, coming over from Australia uh, in the early part of 2021. Do you guys know him? I do. 
Can you hear me? Yes, I know no. him. I had treatment from him. Say that again. I said I had three cycles of treatment uh, from him in Sydney, Australia. Yeah. So uh, the reason uh, I mentioned this is for people that are interested, uh, make sure you uh, look at our schedule and uh, attend if you choose. Now, now to the questions to uh, uh, Dr. Jeremy and Dr. Martin. So when you, um, and I'm talking about uh, diagnostics side of the equation, when you uh, uh, project uh, or when the, uh, when the, uh, uh, you project the, the uh, radiation, into the cell, okay, and you get an image from that process. Uh, what's the can can you get can you can you detect one cell or does it have to be multiple cells to have the appropriate mass to be able to see the cancer? So um, no scan can pick up microscopic disease. It's just the nature of physics that doesn't allow us to, to see microscopic disease. But with PSMA, we're down to lymph nodes that we can pick, pick up with just a couple of millimeters size. So it's from all that's out there, it's pretty sensitive, but uh, down to let's say five millimeters. Um, but that's probably the ultimate limitation of any kind of imaging. So between two and uh, two millimeters and five millimeters, is that what you're saying? No, if it's smaller than five millimeters, it's it's very rare that we'll see anything. Okay, more more than five millimeters. Or, okay. It's a combination. You have the size. Basically, when you what you look at with pets is a global amount of the concentration of the tracer you injected. So the more you have cells that have this PSMA target, the more tracer you will have to be, uh, you have there. And then the more easy it will be detected by the PET scanner. Now you have several ways of having a lot of cells or tracer there. You can have either big lesion, if it's big, of course you have a lot of cells, a lot of targets and a lot of tracer that goes there. You can have a tiny lesion, but with a high density of cancer cell or a high density of PSM expression. And that's also another way, even on the tiny lesions, sometimes you have lesion, it's, it's not uh, frequent, but it's not rare neither, uh, to have tiny lesion below five cent, uh, millimeters that have so much uh, density of PSMA that you can see it with, uh, with PSMA PET. So it's a combination of size and, and of the density of the PSMA and the level of expression by the prostate cancer of the target. Thank you. I but understand. one cell, one cell is not possible. You cannot see one cell. Okay. This you need a microscope. For the answers. Yeah. Okay. Neil, I'm through. Does anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask in mm -hmm. person or submit through chat? Yes. Uh, like Thomas? <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. Where's chat? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Well, um, I, I, my question is about the PSMA scan. I understand that there, and you mentioned this, there are certain percentage of prostate that will not express PSMA. I have had the scan twice, and my PS, my uh, PS, PSA was under three, under one, and it didn't show up on the PSMA scan, although. There were some lesions that showed up when you did a combination of CT PET bone scan or the carbon acetate scan, uh, not the PSMA scan. What I'm wondering is my PSMA now is around three. I'm in a clinical trial at Clinic City of Hope. Is it worth trying a PSMA scan again? Is it possible that with a greater PSA and larger tumors that the PSMA scan might work or my, my cancer might just be among those that it won't express PSMA. So there is a correlation between the, the level of PSA and this, what we call the sensitivity, the ability of the scan to pick up disease. And, you know, the higher the PSA, the more right. likely you will see something. Now, there are, there are unfortunately cancers that don't express, prostate cancers that don't express the target, but they're very, very rare. 
Um, in terms of should you get another scan, uh, you know, you only should do a scan if it will have an impact on whatever treatment um, you're planning to get or if you're looking at different treatments. If you're already getting uh, your honor trial, you're getting treatment, um, it might not add, add much at this point to do a PSMA scan, even if it were. Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to uh, understand is whether PSMA related treatments are uh, available or not. Um, the particular clinical trial I'm on, mm -hmm. uh, the prior version of it was the PSMA scan, um, the um, Amgen 106. I'm on the 509 where they're using a different, different approach. And I'm just thinking ahead, if the clinical trial fails, um, am I a candidate for the PSMA line of treatment? And I was thinking a way of determining that is why my PSA is elevated for me, because I have a fairly indolent can cancer. Um, I might go ahead and get the scan just to see if um, the PSMA PET is sensitive to my cancer. Sure. So, that, so if, you're, if you're thinking, you know, down the line, will at one point want to pursue um, the, the treatment with PSMA, then of course it makes sense to the scan to see yeah. whether that's an option or not. Yeah, I'm hearing from you that, that, that the, the greater the, the, the PSA and the higher, uh, the, the greater the size of the tumors might uh, be more successful for the scan. Thank you very much. When was your last PSMA scan and what was the uh, PSA level at that time? Uh, my last uh, scan was like in February and my PSA was probably under one. And it was I negative. Had, yeah, I had uh, failed uh, my PSA. I had failed Zytiga, Xtandi, um, Laparib, um, and my PSA was, was rising. So um, I got on this clinical trial. So it's the Amgen uh, Byte clinical trial? Yes, Amgen Byte. Um, it's, the, it's a new one. I'm the one of the first. Uh, and the is these, it it's like targeting PSMA? It is not. The one, okay. the, the Amgen 109, 106 targets PSMA. Mine is an antibody. Uh, it's, it's Amgen um, 509, I think, and it's not PSMA. Okay, okay. Well, um, it's difficult to say because your case uh, obviously is not simple and that's straightforward. Without all the informations for us, it's it's not easy to make a, a quick assessment like that. Uh, but of course, the more your PSA is high, the more likely we we can see something on the scan. Um, but just like that, yeah. it would be difficult. Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate your uh, clarification. Thank you so much. Neil, you had a question. Can you read the question on chat? Um. No, I don't have a question on chat right now. If anybody wants to send one, I can read it. Yeah, I don't have one. Frank, I think we found our, our audio problem. Can you hear me? Frank, I think you got a bad microphone. Frank, can you send your question by chat? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, can anyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear Larry Weaver. Larry Weaver has a couple questions. Larry Weaver, go ahead. Okay. Um, I have um, 33 lesions. I'm stage four metastatic, so I have lesions in some lymph nodes, the lungs, and in the bones. Right now, the bones is the biggest problem. Now, because the PSA is so small and it's not going to go undetectable um, under Zytiga and ADT, it's just not going to go undetectable, I have to rely on the PSMA imaging. And uh, I get imaged every six months to 12 months. And the three things that I am using out of the PSMA scans are the number of lesions, the SUV max for the lesions and the size. And uh, what I have done 
is I have created an Excel spreadsheet oh in goodness. which all the lesions are listed that I have. And the reason I'm doing this is that I can tell by looking at, by following a lesion over time through each scan, I'd like to be able to tell whether that lesion is being affected by the treatments or by the proton radiation that I'm getting to certain specific lesions. And I find that um, this is very difficult because um, I, I can't measure success either because when I get a scan and the radiologist re reviews the imaging and compares it to what I've had before, I have asked him or her, asked they, if they would um, compare the previous images identified to what they are now. And so what I want to know is, is a lesion becoming worse? Is it becoming better? So I have an idea if it's responding to the treatment. And what I'm finding is that um, a bunch of the lesions just fall off the map. They never say anything more about them. They don't say they've disappeared, which would make me feel good. They don't at all. So that, that sort of cripples me in trying to see whether my therapies that I'm doing are very good. Um, likewise, size. They, they don't measure size uh, very many of the lesions. And then the last thing is the SUV max. Now, the SUV max, the standard uptake value, is the best indicator of how active the cancer is. However, uh, my question to the doctors is, uh, it's, there seems to be some question as to whether SUV max is worth a hoot in trying to do this. However, it's the only tool that I really have. So in summary, my, uh, is a complaint on my part that the radiologists are not following all the lesions so that I can feel good in myself to say, wow, that one was big. I've done this treatment. It's gone. But they never say anything about it. And I had one recently that uh, was apparently a new lesion. But uh, when the doctors uh, reviewed it at my request, which was very kind of them to do, it was actually a faint one that showed up on a scan six months ago, but nobody said anything about it. So um, it's hard to have a focused question here. Maybe you can comment as best you can. But um, the imaging is the only tool I have, and I'm not getting my money's worth to see where I am and whether I need to change medications. So I've babbled enough. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, reading these scans is, is not trivial and we always try to, to be as concise as possible following every lesion. And, but um, to answer your question, SUVs themselves are helpful, but not should not be used as, as really as the, the prime um, parameter to say whether treatment are working, is working or not. Size is a little bit more reliable, but it's problematic because bone lesions uh, don't uh, lend, rend, um, lend themselves to size measurement. Size measurement of bone lesions is, is, not, is not reliable and that therefore the size is, is not reported. Um, but it, size does matter in, in soft tissue lesions, whether it's a lymph node or a metastatic lesion elsewhere. I think at some point when, when, uh, when somebody has widely metastatic disease, the most important information you get from a scan is whether new lesions pop up or not. Because new lesions really tell us that the treatment is not working. If the disease is stable or if lesions get better, it means that the treatment is having an effect either stabilizing the disease or, or improving the disease. So, um, I mean, I found, find it outstanding that spreadsheet that you put together um, but for, for us reading these images, we really try to get the big picture when we, when we report the impression, big picture meaning saying the disease is progressing, um, it's stable, or it's getting better. And that's really the information that is clinically most relevant, much more than, than following individual lesions. It's really putting it all together and getting the big picture, um, what the clinical response or lack thereof is. 
Does that sort of answer your question? Well, I feel that uh, following <clears throat> the more aggressive lesions and the uh, new lesions um, is rather important because I'm able to, using the imaging, I can identify those lesions which are causing me pain. I can identify new lesions of which I have only really don't have any. You know, they've really, uh, all the soft tissue uh, lesions have become smaller. Uh, the bone lesions, some of them um, just don't respond to the Zytiga or to the ADT and they're, they're growing anyway. So those are whacked by radiation. And that's radiation seems to be, the proton radiation seems to be the only treatment that I is really successful. When it takes a year for the results to show up, but when a lesion is whacked, it's whacked. And uh, with the, um, the medications, the soft tissue lesions seem to respond well, the lung, lung nodules are smaller, but that doesn't allow me to sleep better at night because as long as their tissue there, they're gonna be mutating. And uh, pretty soon, the ones that, that don't respond to the medication have become dominant. Um, the bone lesions causing pain, um, bone pain is pretty serious. And uh, radiation is the only thing that seems to do any good, unfortunately. How many scans did you have? PSMA only, or you, you do a combination of multiple? Oh, my scans start back at uh, the Mayo Clinic about uh, seven years ago with carbon okay. 11 choline, okay. carbon 11 acetate uh, in Phoenix. And um, uh, let me see, we have the multiparametric MRI. PSMA. I remember you, 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 you I, I communicated closely with you at the time when you got an axumin scan and you, you had a PSMA at our place. And for us, it was very interesting to see what PSMA was able to show and incorporate yes. into your axumin scan. Yes, doctor, I, I really appreciate the help you've given me over the years. Um, it's really made a big difference to me. Uh, I had an axumin scan, by the way, and I had a large PSA showed absolutely nothing. And the carbon 11 choline scan, it did not show the lung nodules at all. Only the PET or the CT part showed. But when I did the PSMA scan, all the lung nodules showed up. Also from the carbon 11 choline, I have a parathyroid adenoma in the right side of my neck. It lit up like crazy and the Mayo Clinic thought I had cancer there, prostate cancer. Well, it's, it's false positive. And when I went to the PSMA scans, the parathyroid doesn't show up. So um, an interesting history, but uh, I've had a lot of scans. Okay. So for us, you know, it's very difficult. I just, uh, as just Martin pointed out, one of the other difficulty in patients like you is that you had many scans. So to compare all the scans each time, very difficult. Uh, to get a global picture because sometimes some lesions, they, mm. they show up and then under medication, they decrease, but then they reappear. So it's hard to say sometimes if it's, it's a new lesion or not because you need to compare to all the scans before in patients like you who had multiple scans and multiple lesions. Mm. So not easy for us. And as uh, Martin just said, at the end, what matters is uh, the global picture. And of course, you're also right. What matters is also the pain, like having a full body assessment and able to localize the disease and where your pain mm -hmm. is and make the correlation and monitoring the lesions that mm -hmm. uh, uh, do your pain, I think is still uh, worth to do. And you're also right, the new lesions or the one with sometimes the more aggressive phenotypes, they drive the pronostic of the disease. So, and for this, mm -hmm. you know, PSMA, it, it's very sensitive, but in advanced disease, you have so much change that at the end, it's, it gets very complex. And I don't know if you had other scans already, such as FDG or uh, other types of metabolic tracer. I, use, I know you said just choline, but maybe FDG can show the very aggressive lesions if there are any. And, but what you can be sure also is that by chasing 
spots with proton therapy. For sure, proton therapy gives very high dose focally radiation therapy, and it will blast the lesion there. And well, not only the lesion, everything that is there, basically. But you need to do it everywhere at multiple spots. So at the end, it, it will be difficult to do it. Uh, um, you have to choose carefully where you use it. You cannot do it everywhere. So Yes, and that's why the um, SUV max is the only other criteria you can use to tell it whether has, you uh, again, it's in the pain, in the pain. In the pain, OK, yeah. OK. Do you do bone imaging, such as, I don't know, NIF or bone scan? Um, no. I had this as the bone scans years ago, but uh, I, I don't okay. think they're very helpful. Okay. Okay. Technetium 99 is worthless, and the, uh, they had a sodium something or another bone scan for a while, but then they don't offer that anymore. But uh, PSMA, like you fellows say, is uh, absolutely the best for me. Well, if it helps you, that's that's already very good. But you're also reporting some some difficulties, and I think uh, that it is what it is. This disease is uh, difficult, even for doctors. We're trying our best, and I'm sure we're going in the right direction. But we still have many progress to do. How to better um, evaluate the whole burden of disease? Some people are trying to to use softwares automatic softwares to get rid of this time consuming task for the doctor to get a whole body assessment that gives you the volume of the active disease. And they would compare scan before and after looking at the volume only. And the volume has been shown to be a good predictor of how your disease is responding to a medication. So maybe in the future, this will come with the AI algorithms and will help the radiologist in the very um, time-consuming task you would hope they can do for you, but it's very difficult for, for radiologists to, to, to do this assessment. So maybe AI will help one day for yeah. that. Well, <clears throat> I understand what you're saying, and I don't expect any doctor to spend the time I spent on this Excel spreadsheet. This spreadsheet is very impressive. It is true. It's, 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 I will send you a copy if you wish. It is possible to do, you only have to look at back at the last two scans, and then you can tell if the, the, if the lesion is responding or not, you can tell that because the SUV max is going down, you see. True, true. But if the true. SUV max is going up, and if the size of the lesion is going up, and you fellas say increased activity, that's a bad one. It can metastasize more. That's the one you hit with the proton. And if it has pain too, even more so. So far, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, this will be my fourth time at bat with proton therapy, and I'd say that uh, the number of troublesome lesions has, has decreased. How many PSMA pet did you have? Mm, probably f six, seven. All at UCLA or different places? Um, UCLA, UCSF, and uh, Mater Imaging in Sydney, Australia. I had the lutetium treatment there, you see. Oh, you had the lutetium treatment. Yeah, and I had it early in the disease, and um, it was a total failure. Okay. And um, when it was all said and done, my PSA was uh, 94, and I started it in like 30. Okay. $44,000 counting the travel and the treatments out of pocket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, as I but showed. I tried. I tried. You tried, yeah. And as yeah, I showed, yeah. we, are, we, we don't have a perfect, uh, perfect treatment. We're still learning. And there are some good stories, very good responders, some not. And we still have to do a better job on how to identify earlier, uh, earlier this. But at least you tried, I think. And, and I think it helps you also to get all this uh, treatment knowledge, imaging knowledge, the fact that you're very active on your disease management uh, helps you a lot as well, I think. Yeah, thank you. Neil, do you see the question that I sent over? I see two questions here. Let me start with this one. Are false positives of bone mets on PSMA PET scans common? That's our first of two questions. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I sure can. Are false positives of bone mets on PSMA, 
PET scans common? Hmm. I would um, say not, not common. Yeah. But there are situations where um, we either we can see uptake and there is no nothing that on the CT on the structural information that we get that would indicate um, a bone net. Sometimes this uptake can be very very low and then. It often poses a conundrum whether to call these positive or negative, or um, there are also a number of benign conditions, such as fractures, um, uh, enchondromas, and other things that can have uptake. Um, it's really up to the diligence and, and um, experience of the reader, the radiologist, or nuclear medicine physician reading the scans to, to be able to identify whether it's something benign or something that's related to prostate cancer. But even the most experienced readers sometimes will have to hedge and will not be able to definitely say this is um, cancer or something unrelated to cancer. But to answer your question, it is rare to have false positive if in a diligent and experienced reader. I can okay. add on top of that, that in, with any test, medical test, especially in imaging, you will have the case you're sure the test is negative, the test you're sure the test is positive, and the case in which sometimes it's always in between and you have to make the call, someone has to, to, to call it positive or negative. And this, if a test is not good, this would be 80% of the case where it's a gray zone. If a test is good, it would be five to 10% only because the test is good, such as PSMA PET imaging, then you only limit these uncertain gray zone area lesions to very few cases. For bone, the tricky part is the rib. So in the rib, just by cuffing, just by a little hit, you have some bone trauma with or without fracture. And this can induce some inflammatory, inflammatory response and can show up some uptake a little bit on that. It is faint. It is usually without any CT lesion. And you cannot know very well because also prostate cancer metastasis, they go to the ribs as well. But there was a study and at the end, that's what I, uh, that's what I apply in my practice. There was a study that looked at, I don't know, 60 or 70 solitary rib lesion um, on the PSMA scan in patients without any treatment before. And they followed all this lesion because when it's tricky on imaging, the best information you can get is to have, for the radiologist, is to have a follow-up scan. It's the temporal information. If it decreases, stable or increase, that's the best information to call a lesion positive or not. But that when you have one time point, of course, it's difficult. And so they follow this uh, 70 solitary rib lesions that were indeterminate on a PSMA pet. And at the end, there was only one which turned out to be cancer when it's solitary, isolated like that. So at the end, me, that's my personal call. And, I, and that's what I always uh, tell to at any presentation. If you have one solitary lesion in a rib like that, that is equivocal or you hesitate to, to call it positive, and the uptake is not very high, it's faint, and nothing else elsewhere. You have to give the benefit of the doubt that this is nothing, and you cannot um, remove the patient from the um, curative treatment localized in the prostate uh, because the patient is probably not metastatic. You cannot remove him the right to have a curative treatment and switching already to a systemic therapy. So. That's what I think. But if you have one faint equivocal rib lesion, but there are already many other distant metastases, then it doesn't matter a lot because the patient is already metastatic. What, what about uh, one singular uh, rib lesion that lights up rather dramatically? Dramatically, I mean, if it's dramatic, it's dramatic. You have to call it. But you have also have to correlate it to the history of the patient. If there was a trauma, if you see a clear a CT fracture, sometimes it can be high. What is dramatic? I don't know the SUV. I was just told that it lit up uh, very bright. So for sure, I would not rush 
if you have only one single lesion like that, rush is not good. The three option is to do nothing. The second option we do to, to do a follow-up scan. And usually in three to six months, that's usually something that can help. Or if the your treating physician is a bit uh, worried, he would treat, but I would, uh, it's, it seems difficult. Again, without seeing really the images, it's difficult to make a final call like that. But usually when uh, the disease is still at an early stage, there is nothing else elsewhere and you have a solitary uh, bone uptake in the rib, it's, it's, it can be nothing, but it depends. If it's very dramatic, like you said, I mean, that it can also be a met. And I show you the story of this patient who got one single rib met, treated PSA decreased to zero, three years after he's still free of disease. So it also exists. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other chat question was mine. I think we can, I'm happy to pass on that one. You did a great answer there. Okay. Is, is that yours on the, if a PSMA PET suggests but cannot confirm a single bone met? Is right. that your question too? Yes, that was my, my Okay, question. and we'll pass on that. Next in line is Larry Barman. So, so uh, doctors, uh, Mr. Weaver indicated that he had uh, had a uh, cancer on, on lesion on, on his bone. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if he's tried this or not, but would you recommend him investigating uh, radium-225 to address that one lesion on the bone? So the, the alpha rating treatment is usually not done if, if patients have a single bone lesion. Single bone lesion is better treated with, um, with targeted radiation. Um, the radium treatment is really for patients that have more widespread disease to the bones and have no documented um, what we call visceral metastasis, metastasis lymph nodes um, or other organs. I can um, respond to his question if it's okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I have 16 bone lesions. And um, I have a course definitely because using the whack-a-mole with proton therapy is slow going because I only get four or five treated at a time. Most of those are the ones that are causing me pain. So I've inquired into the uh, Zofigo and um, the FDA approval of Zofigo was done on patients who did not have any or only stable soft tissue prostate cancer tumors. So since I have nodules in the lungs and I have some lymph nodes um, and they don't produce PSA because my PSA is 1.30, um, I can't qualify to take um, Zofigo. However, if the imaging shows no change, but then as the good doctor has said, that's a pretty tough call. Are you going to say, well, you've got no change, you know, because these lesions are still there. They shrunk some, but, you know, how, how are you really going to say I have um, 10 soft tissue lesions? How are you really going to say that they're stable, they're not growing, and therefore I can uh, get um, Zofigo, you see? So uh, I'd love to have it, but uh, I'm not about to go overseas and spend money like I did before to get it in, say, Australia or Germany. You know, it's just too much. Yes. Although I'm sure if you really want to get it, you would ask around, and at some point one doctor would give it to you. Uh, because they, they can always make the call. They have to negotiate, you know with the insurances, but, um, you know, so Figo was, when it was approved, it was a very, very exciting and promising for the whole community. Um, I still think it's a valuable option for patients who had very, a um, lot of pain uh, without any, yeah. many options. That's me. Um, but I wouldn't expect too much neither on Xofigo, but it, it can be worse to try. But 
it it has some some side effects on the bone marrow counts. You know, you have some treatment that go on the bone lesions that will deliver radiation therapy there locally, which is good, kill some cancer metastasis there, but also induce a little bit of bone marrow toxicity on the surrounding uh, marrow around. So it has that, but um, it would be really, I would say, based on your pain level and what are the other current options you have access to. And at the end, you would make your, your, your choice to, to get it. I have a, another question. Um, may I? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> In my latest round of uh, imaging, um, I had a PET CT at UCLA, and then I went to UC San Francisco because San Francisco, it's 800 bucks and it's 2,900 at UCLA. So I went to UCLA and um, I was told by one of the other doctors, none of you folks, that um, a PET MRI would be better for me because I wouldn't get this, the radiation. Well, I did that. But then in this uh, last round uh, at UCLA, I was told uh, we can't really compare PET CTs to PET MRIs. And so um, if you concur with that, uh, what I've got out of this is that uh, you should not get a PET MRI. You should only do PET CTs because everybody can compare them everywhere. Uh, what do you think of that? Um, especially when you have bone disease, the CT part is, uh, is important and you can compare only from modality that are the same. So I would agree for the global picture. Although at the end, you still did the PET, the PSMA part, PET part. One time it was with MRI and before it was the CD. And you can still, you can still compare uh, somehow the PSMA part, PET part only. Um, PET MRI would be better to really assess the local prostate disease for in patients maybe with at early stage, you know, when you need to know exactly where is the prostate cancer within the prostate. Here, MRI performs well, and combining PSMA PET and MRI is a good good option here for patients at early stage disease for the local staging. For bone bone disease assessments, I I, I agree with you. P PSMA PET MRI is probably not the best option. It's not a bad thing. It's just MRI is not that useful here uh, in comparison to CT, especially if you need to compare to other scans, then you really, what you want is really to have reproducibility over time. Um, and the radiation concern, I mean, in your case, um, it, we're talking about CT here. You, we're talking about CT in a patient who received already multiple radiation therapy. So it's like one million times difference of radiation dose. So in a patient who is not undergoing radiation therapy, just by principle, you don't want to give him additional dose of radiation, mm -hmm. even very low on an X-ray or on a CT, which is very low, low amount of radiation. But just by principle, you, you have to be careful and you have to, to measure the risk and always... Uh, justify why you're doing a medical test that involves radiation. But when a patient is, was treated with radiation therapy, here the treatment used very high dose of radiation to kill by aiming at killing cells. So patient already received that. And again, to give some order of magnitude, it's um, one million, almost one, I would say 10 to fifth or 10 to six time higher than a CT. So doing one, two or three or four mile from a city, it doesn't matter in a patient who already had radiation therapy. He already was exposed to much higher dose of radiation. Well, I'm 79 years old. So, you know, if I make it to 85 or 90, uh, even if I didn't have cancer, that would be miraculous. So um, whatever it takes radiation wise, I'm, I'm okay about it. Well, yeah, the CT clearly is like, a, it, it, it's not, it's nothing. We're not talking about a, 
a young child with very sensitive uh, tissue to radiation and who is two years old. It's really another type of, uh, or a young woman with breast and it's, it's another thing. So yeah. I wouldn't be concerned in a prostate cancer patient population about uh, the CT dose because patients are in an older category of age, uh, patients are male, so their radiation uh, sensitivity in their tissue is not so high. And, and it's not the same time that they have to live than a, a 15 years old uh, child. And furthermore, many of the patients already or will receive radiation therapy, which is 10 to fifth or 10 to six time higher. Hmm. Okay. Um, are there any other questions that uh, we can answer tonight? I know we're a little bit over time here. Um, but I have I one more question, but uh, as long as I mean, it's up to you. You know, I'm easy. Doctors, are are you willing to get one more question in? Okay, one last. One last okay. question. Okay. Okay. Here's the last question. Um, it's my understanding that the lutetium-177 PSMA-617 treatment doesn't really work all that well on bones as compared to soft tissue because the structure of the bone shields the other cancer cells from the radiation of the ones that absorb the, yeah, the lutetium. Whereas in the soft tissue, they're shooting radiation in all directions and all their buddies get zapped. But in the bones, they don't. So. I was under the impression that the uh, treatment just doesn't work all that well for bone lesions. So, would you have I been misinformed? What do you think about? No, that? I think I think it's it's probably right. If you have to rank the sensitivity of the lesions uh, based on their origin or the where they where they are, lymph nodes are the lesion that respond the best, and I think that's what you observe in your case as well, even with uh, Zytiga or other medication. Then it would be the bones, bones still in some patients, they respond well, but uh, you have interpatient variation. Some patients would respond well and some are not. And then the one that are the more tricky to treat are the liver lesion, because here the liver, it has a specific environment in which uh, mutations occur usually with the differentiation and appearance of more aggressive phenotype. Uh, so that would be the rank of order so I don't say it doesn't work in bone lesion. We have good stories also with lutetium PSMA, with bone lesion reduction, but it's true. I think if you have to compare many patients with bone only versus many patients with lymph nodes only, the patient with lymph nodes only would respond better. But on an individual basis, it's always difficult to make a call. Thank you. Thank you doctors for, for staying with us um, this extra time. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I have to close the meeting and uh, we will be sending out a survey and next month we will have Dr. Pugash discussing HIFU. Uh, we hope you have a great evening and, and uh, stay healthy and, and uh, stay safe. Thank, Thank you, you very much. For Thank you very us. much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, doctors.